Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Oda, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I have with me today my colleague, Lyle Tavernier. He is going to help us through some of the uh, programming activities that occur throughout the challenge. Uh, today, our focus is on the last uh, section of the challenge, uh, the Mission to Mars Student Challenge, that is, which is sample handling. Um, and before we get started, I want to find out a little bit about you. So if you would please answer these questions on my poll. I'd like to know what grade levels the youth are in your program. You can select more than one grade band. Um, also, what kind of program are you running this summer? Are you fully back in person? Are you running a virtual or at home program? Or is it a hybrid? Uh, that'll help us understand uh, and give you tips for, for what you're doing. And then also let me know your general experience in delivering STEM programs. Um, is, are you brand new? Are you an old pro? Uh, it's good for us to know that. And then let me know, uh, have you joined us before? I, I do recognize some of your names. I'm getting to know you folks by your names. Um, so have you, have you joined us before either in person or by watching the recordings? Um, if you are brand new to us, welcome. Um, hopefully you'll get uh, some, some fun stuff today. And if you have not yet uh, watched our previous recordings, please uh, go ahead and do those as you need. We covered the, uh, the different weeks of the challenge. We have seven weeks of the challenge. We ended up with six trainings, I believe, uh, because we combined a couple of them, but uh, give you an idea of what's going on out there. And just a reminder, this uh, training is for staff. So adult staff members of out of school time programs or even in school time programs are fine. Um, but if you are a student, we ask that you disconnect. Uh, student programs start in, uh, in an, another few days. So this is, this is for staff, not for students. Um, and uh, my colleague, colleagues Amelia and Joyce are online with us today. Amelia has posted the recordings, link to the recordings on the Museum, Alliance, Museum and Informal Education Alliance page. So uh, take a look at that for the recordings if you need to refresh yourself. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll here and take a look at our results. Looks like uh, we have students in all grades with a, an upper elementary focus uh, for many of you. That's wonderful. Uh, scratch programming might be a little tough for the K2 crowd, but um, for the upper elementary, middle school and high school, those kids love it. Uh, one of my friends uh, has taught it with third graders and they, they really get a kick out of it. And another one of my friends taught it with 12th graders and just you know, made it a little more complicated and, and they really got into it. So it's, it's really flexible for different grade levels. Um, looks like a bunch of you are doing virtual and at home. Uh, some of you are doing in person and some of you are doing a, a hybrid both. So uh, scratch programming is something that is really adaptable for uh, the virtual world. So, cause it's all on an online interface. So very cool. Um, and it looks like some of, we got a, quite a number of beginners uh, for delivering STEM programs, wonderful. Hopefully we are gonna give you something that is an automatic draw for your students. It's, uh, it's Scotch programming is a lot of fun and creating their own video games. That's something kids really get into. And for those of you who have a, it as a regular program, um, regular part of your program, or you've done it for several years, um, feel free to, to pipe in on the Q&A. You can use the Q&A for more than just questions. Uh, feel free to pipe in with your wisdom if you've done this sort of stuff before. We're happy to hear from you. Um, and it looks like we have a spread of folks who are new to our trainings and some of you who are devoted followers. Well, welcome all of you. Um, very happy to have all of you here. Again, if it is your first training and you want to go back to hit the rest of them, we have them recorded and you can check the chat for that link. All right, so we have um, a couple of slides here to talk about the, the big idea. Those of you who've been with us before have seen these, those of you who are brand new, 
let's take a look here. The Mission to Mars Student Challenge is something that my team at JPL came up with um, to help celebrate and celebrate the, the Perseverance uh, Mission to Mars and encourage your students to get involved because kids love, love the Mars robots and they, they love to actually get involved themselves. So what we did is we created a seven week program that helps you lead students in designing and building a mission to Mars. Um, we're gonna not go through the website today too much. Uh, it's go.nasa.gov slash Mars challenge. If you haven't been there yet, please go there at some point and check out all of the lessons. Everything that uh, my colleague Lyle is doing today is going to be found on that page under the last week, which is sample collection. The Mars Perseverance Rover is driving around on Mars looking for interesting rocks, going to cache samples, take samples of rocks, leave them on the surface, and then in the future, we're going to have a Mars sample return mission. So that Mars sample return mission is going to pick up those samples and bring them back to Earth. The only problem with that plan is we don't have the technology yet. So this is one of those things that's kind of fun. Your students could actually, uh, they're not just like solving some problem that somebody else has solved before. You're actually having them think through a problem that hasn't been solved before, which is, is uh, really engaging for students. Um, and speaking of engaging, our goal is to engage youth in all 50 states um, and around the world. But uh, we're looking at the 50 states and the territories as our primary audience. Um, we hope to involve underserved communities. We try to make everything we do accessible to anyone. So online interfaces, of course, are pretty accessible as long as a student has internet, which, uh, Hopefully by now, a lot of students are able to find internet somewhere. Um, and we hope that our, the hands-on activities we've done in the previous sections are accessible to most people because we use kind of commonly available materials, not, not something fancy you gotta go out and buy, spend a whole lot of money on. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're just trying to raise awareness of this landing on Mars and the continued exploration. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a seven week plan. There are lesson plans for elementary, middle, high school, uh, things that can be scaled up, scaled down. Um, we started out, we start out learning about Mars. So if you haven't watched that session, go take a look at uh, how we encourage students to learn about Mars. Then once they know a little bit about Mars, we want them to plan their mission and we lead them through that. There's a couple of different games for older kids and, and some, uh, circle uh, plan your tools. And we also have little videos about how we plan a mission. Um, then we launch our mission, we land on Mars and we explore the surface. So that seven week plan is divided up like that. Um, exploring the surface is two parts. It's exploring the surface and uh, what we call, we call it surface operations and sample handling. Uh, so you're in the middle or actually toward the end of our one hour webinars uh, to show you some of our, our activities. We're not we're not be able to show you all of them because some of these weeks we have like 21 activities. It's like crazy. We have all this stuff. So we're trying to pick out kind of our favorites. Um, and then um, at the end of this month and into July, we have uh, some talks with subject matter experts for our youth. So on the left here, you see we're on June 17th, sample handling. Our next get together will not be until the middle of July, at which point we hope you will, will share with us some of the interesting things you've been able to accomplish with your students. I know you folks are super creative, uh, probably substantially more creative than I am. And frankly, I like to learn from you. So I'm really looking forward to that. So we're gonna be soliciting uh, folks to contribute to presenting. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, so our youth programs, um, starting next week, we have a variety of scientists and engineers who are going to be taking questions from students. Our partners at the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, are hosting these for us. And the um, you're able to have your students sign up on their own, or you can sign them up. Uh, it's all on the Museum and Informal Education Alliance page. Um, you, we ask that you submit questions ahead of time. 
Uh, but they also may be taking some questions during the program if they don't get enough questions ahead of time. But this is being advertised all over the place, so uh, you might want to get your question in early. Um, but each week, it's going to be focusing on a different portion of the mission. So um, my colleague Joey Jefferson is going to be our first guest um, about learning about Mars. Really great guy, a lot of, a lot of fun. So uh, be sure to have your students tune in for those. Um, now, the issue of uh, what does it take to do this stuff? Well, it's not, it's not that hard, OK? Um, this section on um, coding is probably the hardest stuff we have. Um, and, but mostly, we expect that you know how to work with kids, because that's your gig, right? You know how to gather some materials, um, get your kids moving. You know how to follow some directions and get the kids thinking about things. And you also want to learn on your own. Uh, we ask that you, we don't expect you to know everything. We expect that you want to learn with your kids. So we help uh, lead you through those things. Um, and hopefully don't, you don't feel too intimidated about stuff that is uh, foreign because we, we want you to, to learn as you go. Um, now, with the Scratch programming, we don't have to worry too much about safety, <laughs> except internet safety, of course. Uh, but anytime you have projectiles or anything, we want to be careful that uh, you're, you're following proper safety protocols. All right, so today, um, mentioned we are going to be creating video games using Scratch. Now, uh, my colleague Lyle is a tech genius of sorts, and He's asked that you create, you answer these questions on the poll so he knows what kind of technology you're using. Uh, what kind of device are you using for the Scratch coding portion of today's training? Is it a Windows desktop laptop, Mac desktop or laptop? Is it a Chromebook, an iPad, or is it something else completely? Um, and then uh, what's your level of, of experience with Scratch um, or any other coding language? Have you done some before? a little, a lot, or are you like I was uh, a few years ago, actually just about two years ago when Lyle was like, hey, let's do scratch programming. And I'm like, what? What is that? And I had to learn it, uh, but I learned it from Lyle and Lyle's a really good teacher. So hopefully uh, that'll be, it'll be uh, the same experience that you have. All right, let's take a look at our results here. So we've got uh, most of you on a Windows desktop or laptop, a couple of you on a Mac, uh, somebody on an iPad and somebody on something altogether different. And then that'll work. We uh, will make some uh, comments about different platforms. Um, but just the nice thing about Scratch is it is a web interface. So it's pretty, pretty easy to use on just about anything. Um, and it looks like some of you have a bit of experience with Scratch or another coding language, cool. Um, and for those of you who have no experience, welcome to my world. Um, but uh, I think you're going to have a lot of fun with this. Uh, Lyle is, uh, like I mentioned, he's a really good teacher, and hopefully uh, you'll you'll be able to follow along. And we will be taking questions in Q and A if uh, if something uh, pops up that you um, that you have trouble with. So um, Lyle, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll have to forgive me. I was having um, an, a, a sneezing and coughing attack while um, Oda was talking. My allergies just decided to act up. So hopefully that's over and done with <clears throat> and we'll get uh, we'll get going. So I'm excited to talk with you about um, Scratch. And uh, as Oda mentioned, it's really great to have things that you're um, or really great to have the uh, the, the desire to learn something new as you're going about um, these activities and Scratch is a great opportunity for that. Um, I learn something new about Scratch almost every time I teach it or do a lesson with it or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and so today I'll probably learn some new things as well. Um, it's interesting that a lot of you are um, working with different platforms. The person who's doing other, um, depending on what the other device you're using today is, um, this may end up being a session where you're watching more than participating. All of you are welcome to just watch if you want. Um, of course, this is recorded, so you can go back and kind of follow along if you want later. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, 
um, we'll be doing some some hands on stuff as well. So you'll be able to to try scratch and, and do some different things with it and see how how it goes along because I'll be talking about it and showing it at the same time you will be working on it. Um, I'm going to try to be as verbal as I can be and describing what I'm doing, because if you are looking at your scratch programming screen and uh, not looking at my screen as an example, um, if I don't clearly describe what I'm doing, that's going to be hard for you to um, maybe understand what to do on your screen. Um, and the reason I say that is because I noticed that 75% of you are going to be doing this virtually. And so again, if you've got students who are working on their computer at home and you're remote trying to describe what to do, it's really important to be as verbally descriptive as you can as you're going through this. <clears throat> it's also really nice that we have a variety of um, different devices that are being used today, um, Macs, Windows, iPads, uh, because that may be the experience that you have working with kids um, remotely. Who knows what they're working with at home? Um, maybe you're fortunate enough to have a set of devices that everybody's going to be using, um, but it's been my experience that a lot of people um, working with kids at home um, are working with kids who have a lot of different devices. And so I'll talk about how we can sort of address that because there, there are some differences that can create some challenges in getting things set up. But once you're in Scratch, because it is web-based, it should be pretty much the same for everyone. Um, if you're on an iPad, because you have um, the touchscreen keyboard versus the um, physical keyboard of a Mac or a Windows machine, that might play in and cause um, some difficulties, but, but it does work. So. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to point out um, the link here in the chat. This is the Scratch activity we'll be talking about today, which is how to code a Mars sample collection video game. So as Oda mentioned, we're going to collect samples with the Perseverance rover. And in the future, we'll be sending another set of missions to collect those samples and return them to Earth. And so what this video game that students will, will create is sort of the, the, the future mission that's going to go around and collect those different samples. And I am going to share my screen just so I can point out a couple of different things here. And what you see on the screen is the link that I just showed you. This is the um, how to code, code a Mars sample video collection. I cannot talk how to code a Mars sample collection video game. Um, kind of gives you um, a step-by-step -step and this is, this is designed for um, students to go through and look at step by step. So um, this is something that you'd be able to share with them if they're doing um, <clears throat> if they're doing this virtually. It's also available in the Mission to Mars Student Challenge site. So if that's where you're at, you'll be able to find this. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that if you're using different devices, you may run into issues getting things set up. So you'll notice in the materials, we have some downloadable files. These are different images that you'll need. And depending on what device you're using, whether it's a Windows machine or a Mac or an iPad, um, these things work differently, whether you're having to right click and save as, um, depending on what type of computer you have, zip files might work a little bit differently. I know in Macs, they sort of open automatically with a Windows machine, you kind of have to extract them. Um, and so I've actually created a shortcut to help you get around this, but, the reason I have this here is so that you can see really all you need is a computer with internet access, a free Scratch account. Technically, you don't need an account. You just need to go there. The account is if you want to save your work and go back to it later, which is a lot of fun. Um, and it allows you to share what it is that you're doing. Um, and students can share their games with other participants as well. Um, <clears throat> so getting set up is really uh, I find it the most challenging part for everybody because again, um, where things get downloaded on computers varies from, from person to person. Um, but step one is really getting set up. Um, it doesn't involve any coding. And so I've set up some links that I'll put in the chat in a moment that will allow you to kind of skip this part and get right into the coding with the, with the students. But if you do want your students to um, get set up, if you want your camp participants to get set up and go through this, the instructions are here uh, on how to use these downloaded files here and then <clears throat> get the game board set up. And from there, once you have everything set up, it's a matter of making the rover drive. So if this is a video game where you're driving a rover, 
first thing you've got to do is allow your um, game to be to be playable. Um, and then from there, every step is an additional part of the game. So creating sample tubes for um, collection. Um, driving a rover around is pretty neat. And I think kids will get a kick out of it when they first do their programming, but then they're actually going to want to have the challenge of some sort of game activity to do. Um, and then again, every step beyond that is an additional game challenge. So um, games are fun and they're more challenging when you have a limited amount of time, just like a mission on Mars, you've got a limited amount of time before the mission is over. Um, and then a scoring system. So we're not keeping score on Mars, but um, there are things that are um, valuable and that, that can be science that we collect, can be samples that we collect, it can be things that we learn. Um, and games are just kind of fun when they've got a point system so you can um, compare how you're doing against someone else or how, um, how you're doing against yourself from game to game. Um, and then um, as in adding hazards, if you wanna drive around, um, it becomes a lot harder when there are areas that you can't necessarily drive around to. Um, so these are the different steps. Um, I'm not going to go through every step, but you'll see there are more steps that continually make the game more challenging to play, but also more challenging to create. So um, <clears throat> I think that's a lot of fun. Uh, let me get back to our window here. Where is Scratch? All right, I see a... Oh, I saw a question. Looks like it was answered. Great. Um, all right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to put into a, the chat. Oh, and I will mention there are actually three Scratch activities that we have. Um, there's Code of Mars sample collection game. There's Drive a Rover around, which is very similar to the Code of Mars sample collection game. Um, and then there is also Code of Mars helicopter game. Um, also similar, but different enough that if you've done one, it's not going to be the exact same programming solution to, to get the answer here. Um, so it's it's pretty neat to, to be able to um, try the different different programs. So let's see if I can get to the chat and put in a link. So this next link that I'm putting in is the preloaded project. And what that means is we've skipped step one. We don't have to download things. We don't have to unzip things. We don't have to do any of that. And what you get is, I guess I need to put that in, here we go. What you should see if you follow that link is the Mars sample rover collection and in parentheses background rover and sample collection tubes. And um, you'll see my little picture here in the top. That just means that I've created it. Um, that doesn't mean you've accidentally logged into my account. Um, if you do have a free scratch account, you can sign in from this page It'll bring you right back. Um, this is a link that you can share with students so that they don't have to do all that um, downloading and unzipping and everything like that. They can get right into programming. We're not going to take the time to create a Scratch account right now. If you do have a Scratch account, sign in. If at the end of this, you think this is super cool, I want to save everything I've done, you'll be able to join Scratch from within um, the program, and um, then you'll be able to save it. Uh, but it does take a few minutes, so we're not gonna we're not gonna go through the the join joining process. I'm not even gonna sign in myself. All I'm going to do, and if you are following along hands on with this program and you want to, you're gonna go ahead and click on see inside. And what this is is this lets us look kind of under the hood, for lack of a better term. It lets us look at the coding that makes this game possible. And right now, because we don't want to give away the answers to our participants, it's empty. So I click on see inside and there this center area right here where our code will go is empty. So to navigate and show you around a little bit what we're looking at over on the left hand side, these are all of our code blocks. These are the things that we will um, put together to create some visual code that will tell the video game what to do when we want to play it over here on the uh, upper right hand side. This is what's called the backdrop. And it's sort of um, it's the stage where the game takes place and it it allows us to test out and see what our game looks like. And then down here underneath, we've got what we call sprites. And these are um, ones that I've preloaded, but these are the elements in the game. And so we've got a fetch rover and we have a sample tube. And you'll notice I can 
um, click and move them around on my screen. So these are elements that are separate from uh, the backdrop. Um, and this backdrop image is actually an image um, taken of Mars. It's taken from orbit down looking at the surface where the Perseverance rover actually landed in Jezero Crater. So it's um, accurate in that sense. The rover is much, much bigger um, in this video game than what it would look like on Mars. Um, if you were to look at this image and see the rover in real life, it would be a tiny, tiny speck here. Um, and that's just not a very fun video game when you can't see anything. So for this game, we make it a little bit bigger. Um, so step one is we have to make this rover move because right now this isn't a video game. This is just three pictures of Mars, a rover, and a sample tube that are just sort of sitting there. And so when we create code, we have to create code for the thing that we want to do something. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about the fetch rover. So if you are not clicked on the fetch rover, make sure you click on the fetch rover down in the lower right-hand side. And now we're going to create some code that will make the rover move. So if you look over on the left-hand side, you have a couple of different circles that are different colors. So you have motion, looks, sound, events, control, sensing, operators, variables, and then my blocks. These are all different blocks that are sort of grouped to help us find things a little bit easier. So when we're talking about making the rover move, we're not going to look in sound. We're not going to look in uh, variables. We're going to look in motion. And so in the case of making the rover move, we have different options, but the simplest one is move 10 steps. And I'm going to click and drag that right into this center column. And when I let go, nothing happens because we're not really doing anything, uh, but you can test it out and see what it does by clicking on it. So I click on it. And if I look on the, the stage area, the backdrop area, when I click on it, every time I click on it, it's actually moving a little bit. So this gives me an idea of what this block will do. And within Scratch, not just in this block that we're using, but there are a lot of different blocks um, that will have uh, white circles or open spaces where you can change what you want it to, to, to do. So in the case of moving 10 steps, it kind of jumps around a little bit and that's not really what I want it to do. I want it to be a little bit smoother. So I'm gonna make it move one step. And now when I click on it, it's going to move a much, much smaller distance. Um, <clears throat> and you can allow uh, the, the, the kids to um, play around with these numbers and see what happens. Um, they may try to put in some huge number which they'll think is funny, but suddenly the game's not playable. Um, and when they get feedback from other kids about how their game is, they might decide, oh, maybe I shouldn't have it move 50 steps at a time because then it's just not fun and I, I can't actually get to where I wanna go. Um, now, the next thing that I have to do is I have to sort of tell it when to move. And one of the nice things about Scratch is there are lots of different ways to do things. So um, you might have one kid who, gets the rover to move using a certain combination of blocks. You might have another kid who gets the rover to move using a different combination of blocks. So, um, and this is where I always, I always get confused and I forget. So don't feel bad if you don't remember where everything is. I never remember where things are, um, but I'm gonna just check under events. So the simplest way to get the rover to move is using this block here. I so I clicked on events that says when, and then there's a little drop down menu here. Space key is pressed. You can actually select different keys um, depending on what keyboard keys you want um, to control the rover. And you'll notice that when I click and drag it over, there is a little notch underneath that happens to match the little notch that is cut out uh, at the top of the move one steps block. And so I can link them. And I don't want my space key to be the one that moves this because eventually I'm gonna want this to move in different directions. And looking at my keyboard, the best way to find something or to, the best keys I think to use that will let me move in different directions are the arrow keys. So I'm going to say up. Now, when I press the up arrow key, it's going to move. 
And if you're watching me or if you're following along and pressing um, the up key, your rover should be moving every time you press the up key. Now, when you press the left key or the down key or the right key, nothing happens. And the reason is because we haven't told the, um, the program what to do when we press those keys. And now what I want to do is I want to show you an example of how we can do things differently or do the same thing in different ways using Scratch. So I'm going to go back over to my motion blocks and I'm going to take another move 10 steps block and I'm going to drag it into that center column and I'm going to change it so that it's moving one block. And we're going to add some um, additional blocks here. Let me find it here. This is um, this is a more advanced way to do what it is that we're doing. And I, I put this in here because it allows kids to create more complex games. And so I'm going to click over here on the control circles, and it brings me up a bunch of control blocks. And the one that I want is what's called an if then statement. And this is sort of like cause and effect. So if something happens, then something else is going to happen in the game. And we have to tell it what it is that we want to do. And in, so I'm gonna drag it over here. And in, in this instance, the then, like the effect of what we want to happen is we want it to move one step. And I like to call this like an alligator um, or monster or whatever you wanna call it. Um, it's going to eat this command block. I can actually drag the move one steps block that I put in there and I can drop it right in there. So now it's saying if something, that's what this little hexagon shape here, if something happens, then move one step. So I've got to find some, some command that's going to go in here. And again, this is one of those ones I, I always forget where it is. So I'm going to kind of click around and I go to the sensing. And there's actually a, a block in sensing that's very similar to that when the up arrow key is pressed that we used earlier. And it's this blue hexagon that says key space pressed. It's hexagon. It's a perfect fit, even though it looks a little bit wider than the hexagon that we need. Um, Scratch will uh, allow us to make it fit in there. So I, I drag it into that hexagon. The hexagon gets a white outline and I can just let go and it stretches out to fit there. Now I have to decide what key I want. Um, I've used up arrow already, so I'm going to use down arrow. And let's see here. So I've used the down arrow key is pressed. Now this is where it gets good because you would think if you press the down arrow key at this point, something should happen. And the kids are probably going to think the same thing. Well, the computer needs to know when it's going to do this. And we use this when up arrow key pressed earlier. That's great, but it's really limiting. I'm going to go back to the events block and I want to introduce the green flag block. So when the green flag is clicked, that's like telling the, um, the game or the program. When I click the green flag, and you'll see the green flag um, in the upper part of the page uh, above the stage backdrop area, you can think of that as like a start button for a video game. So I'm going to say when the green flag is clicked and it's got that notch so it fits right in there, what it'll do when I click that green flag, now if I press the down arrow key, Again, nothing's happening. And this is what's great because it gets kids thinking very, very, very methodically. They've got to really think about the order of things and they've got to think about exactly what the computer is, is reading or what they've told the computer to do because the computer can't figure things out by guessing what they meant. They have to tell it. So when I click the green flag, this program looks to see if I'm pressing the down arrow key. And if it's not, sorry, if I'm not pressing the down arrow key, when I click the flag, 
it says, okay, I'm done. I'm not going to keep looking. You click the green flag. You weren't pressing the down arrow. I'm done. So we have to tell this program that when I click the green flag, look to see if I'm pressing the down arrow and keep looking and keep looking for as long as I'm playing the game. And there is a block for that. So I'm going to go back to controls and I'm going to introduce what's called a forever loop. And here you've got forever. I'm going to drag it over into that middle column. It's got that alligator mouth. So I can actually disconnect the key down arrow pressed if then statement that I made. I can drag it right into that alligator mouth. It stretches out to get it all. And then I can drag the forever block underneath that when the green flag is clicked. Now, when I click on that green flag, you'll notice that there is a yellow outline around that entire set of blocks that I made. And what's happening now is it's looking and looking and looking to see if I press that down arrow. And it's gonna keep looking until I stop playing the game. So it's gonna do it forever. Now, this is another great part because Kids will say, all right, pressing the down arrow. And if you're watching me or if you're following along hands on, you'll notice you press that down arrow key and it's moving upward. And again, the reason is the program looks for exactly what we told the program to do. We didn't tell it to look down. We didn't tell it to turn around. So it's just going to move in whatever direction it happens to be. And so again, we're going to have to add additional blocks. And this is what's great because it's trial and error. And then it gets kids thinking, what do I have to do next? Or what didn't I do? Why is it doing this thing in a weird way? So I'm going to go back to motion because again, I'm talking about turning. And when I look at these different commands, I've got different options. A lot of times, the first thing kids will want to do is They'll want to pick, oh, I need to turn. Whether or not they know degrees or not, they're, they're going to say, I want to turn. Now they can do that, but the rover will turn depending on what way it's already pointed. And so if it's pointed maybe to the left and it turns, it's not always going to turn downward. Um, if it's pointed to the, to the left, that turn will make it turn upward. So there's actually a better command we can use here. And if you've kind of been glancing at the commands here on the side of the screen, you'll see there is a point in direction. And this is a really good one to use. Um, so I'm gonna drag it over into that center column. And it has degrees, like 90 degrees. If your kids don't know degrees, that's totally fine because when you click on it, it comes up with a circle wheel that has an arrow pointing. So all they need to know is what direction do I want this to point? And in this case, we want it to point down because we're talking about using the down arrow. And as soon as I do that, the degrees change. If they know degrees, they'll see it change. If they don't know degrees, maybe they'll learn a little bit about degrees. And then we can click and drag this. This Again, this is great. We don't have to disassemble everything and put it back together. We can say, well, we want this to go right here. And so I'm dragging the point in direction block into the if then block. So now I have this set of blocks that says when the green flag is clicked. So like when I hit start forever, look to see if we're pressing the down key. If we are, then point down and move down one step. And sure enough, when I press that, if you're looking at my screen or if you're following along hands-on, your down arrow key should now make that rover move down. My up arrow key suddenly doesn't do what I want it to do because we didn't tell it to point up. So as kids start adding blocks, they may realize, oh, this, this, worked before, but now it doesn't because of something else that I did. And so again, you can ask them, well, what can you do to fix it? How can you change it? How can you add it? And in this case, we can just take that block that we just learned about, the point in direction, and 
we want it to point up. So I'm going to click on that 90 degrees and I'm going to drag that arrow to point up. And then I'm going to drag it into this block. So now when I click the up arrow, I move up and I can actually press and hold the up arrow and it looks like it's kind of smoothly driving. That's actually why I like the one step versus 10 steps. Um, it looks smoother than if I had like two steps or five steps or 10 steps. Um, all right, so now I've got a rover that moves up and down, which is really fun if my um, sample tubes are above or below me, but they're to the left here and I can't turn to the left. So next thing I wanna do is show you a really nice little shortcut so that once kids learn how to make the block, they don't have to do sort of the tedious dragging and dropping over and over and over. So what I can do is I can right click on the entire block and I can just hit duplicate. So you see this menu comes up, it says duplicate. It's going to recreate that entire block set and it puts it right on top. It's kind of hard to tell that it's there, but I can just drag it and move it away and now I have this second set of blocks. And you'll notice that as I move things around, that that middle column just sort of expands, so I've got a lot of space. Now, I have two sets of commands for the down arrow key, but I really want a left key and a right key. And all I really have to do is click on that drop down menu where it says down arrow, and I can select my right arrow or my left arrow. Um, I'll pick my right arrow first. The other thing that I need to remember is that that's not the only thing I have to change here because I've got my point in direction and that's also really important. So when I have my right arrow key pressed, I wanna move to the right. That means I have to point to the right. So I'm gonna click on the point in direction 180 and I'm gonna drag that arrow so that it's pointing to the right. And now it should do what I want it to do. You'll notice it doesn't have that yellow glowing box around it. So if I hit the green flag again, now it's running. And sure enough, when I press that arrow, if you're following along hands-on or if you're just watching, you'll see that I now can move up, right, down, but not left. So same thing as before, I can right-click, duplicate, put my block here, just in an empty space. You notice they can kind of sit on top of each other. That's absolutely fine. Um, some kids will want theirs nice and neat. Others will not care if they're stacked on top of each other. The only trouble with having them stacked on top of each other is that if there's a problem with your code, it might be hard to see. Um, but it, it doesn't matter if they're sort of stacked on top of each other. So just as before, I'm going to click that key pressed down arrow and I'm uh, drop down menu, excuse me, can get kind of confusing depending on your, your use of language. Uh, I'm going to select left arrow. I'm going to select point in direction 90 degrees, excuse me, negative 90 degrees or to the left. And I'll click my green flag again because right now you don't see the yellow outline, so it's not running. So I click the green flag and sure enough, there we go. We've got a rover that will drive around on the surface. So that is the, the after we get things set up, that's part, uh, I guess that's technically part two in the instructions, um, but that is uh, how we can get our rover to move. Now, this took a while, it took about 15, 20 minutes, depending on how much time you have um, to commit to this. You may have to do one section per day. Maybe this is something that you do over the course of a week and you commit 20 minutes a day to it. So day one might be, we're going to make the rover drive. Day two might be, we're going to learn how to collect the samples. Um, day three might be adding a timer. Um, day four might be another, another portion. And what's kind of neat is once you get the rover driving, you can do the other parts in any order. If you think, I don't really want a timer. I want to be able to play this game as long as I can. I just love driving around on Mars. You don't have to put a timer in. If you don't want a scoring system, if you just, you just want to drive around and you don't care how many points you get, you don't have to do that. But each of these different parts 
is an additional coding challenge that you can add to the game that makes it a little bit more complex and a little bit more fun and exciting to play. So I'm gonna check real fast. Looks like no open questions. Awesome, thank you. Um, looks like Oda's got something in there about, yeah, right clicking. If your Mac doesn't do right click, thank you, Oda. Control click will work just as well and it will bring up that menu. All right, so uh, going back to my Code of Mars helicopter, excuse me, Code of Mars sample collection game, um, after we make it drive, we want to collect some sample tubes. Now these instructions, um, they, they include, or sorry, the challenge includes, let me get back to where I need to be. The challenge includes um, adding the, the sprite for the sample tube in there. It's already in there though. Now there are a couple, again, this is, this is again, what's neat about Scratch is there is more than one way to collect a sample tube. Now, if I was on Mars, just me personally, and there was a sample tube on the ground and someone was watching me, I picked it up, I collected it, that sample tube wouldn't be on the ground anymore. So we have to make this program find a way to um, make it look like the tube has been collected when I get there. So I can drive over there. And when I drive over there, right now, nothing happens. I just drive over the sample tube. And if you're watching, following along, you can see that absolutely nothing happens when I do that. So what we have to do is we have to make that sample tube get collected. And when I click on the sample tube sprite in the lower section underneath the stage backdrop area, you'll see that it gets highlighted. And you'll also see that all that code block that we created has disappeared. It's still there. It's just attached to the fetch rover. So if I click on the fetch rover, it's still there. Don't worry, we didn't lose it. But when I click on sample tube, I've got an empty, empty code uh, section where I can put what I want to happen. Now, the when green flag clicked is so important to all of these games because it's like a go button that I'm just going to start with that green flag clicked from the events section. So I'm going to drag that when clicked, I want something to happen. And what I want to happen is when this rover comes over to me, I want it to look like things have been collected. So this is an if then or a cause and effect. So I'm going to look for that control block where I've got an if then statement and I can drag it around here. Right now, nothing happens when I click it because I haven't put anything in the uh, hexagon or in the alligator's mouth. <clears throat> so I've got to decide what's going on here. Um, now, over here in the sensing button, and I'm kind of giving you a lot of hints here, telling you where to go, what to look for. This is an area that kids can explore and try different things. You don't have to say, go to the sensing, you might just have them look to see what's available and see if there's there are any options. And in this case, I'm gonna take this touching because the rover actually has an arm, it's going to go out and collect those sample tubes. So it is going to technically touch that uh, sample tube. And so what we wanna do, you'll notice this hexagon shape is gonna fit nicely in the if then block. If, and again, we're talking about the sample tube here, if the sample tube is touching there's a drop down menu, meaning we can select different things here. And our, one of our options is that fetch rover that's already loaded here. So if I'm going to select fetch rover, if touching fetch rover, then what? What do we want to have happen? Well, we, we don't have a block that says get collected and send it back to Earth. That's, that's not something that's built into Scratch. But if we want it to look like it's been collected, meaning it doesn't show up there, we can go to the looks section. And if we scroll around, there are actually some blocks that might be helpful here. So the hide block, if I drag it over here, will make that sprite disappear if we put it into the if then. So now I've got a, a, an if then statement that says, if you're touching the fetch rover, then hide, or in other words, disappear. So I click it right here. Or I, I click it right here. That does not help you if you're not watching me. I drag the if then block to the when the green flag is clicked. I click on the green flag. 
I drive over, nothing happens, uh, and I'm going to drive away. The reason the reason nothing happened um, is because the same reason as before. When I click the green flag, the program looked to see if the sprite the the sample tube was touching the sample uh, the fetch rover. It wasn't, so it stopped looking. This is where we go back to our control blocks and we take that forever loop and we put it around the if then statement. Now it's going to say, all right, green flag is clicked. The yellow outline tells me I am running this block. Now when I drive this fetch rover over to that sample tube, collected, it disappeared. It is no longer there. Cool, we just completed our mission. We drove over to our sample tube and we collected it. So that can be the entire game. Um, you'll notice it was a lot faster to create this block than to get the rover to drive. Some sections are much quicker, especially once you have introduced things like an if-then statement, if you've introduced things like the green flag clicked block, or if you've introduced the forever, uh, forever loop, once kids get a sense of those things, they'll start clicking and getting things ready. Um, they'll know, oh, I need a green flag click block. I'm, I, if I'm using if then, I probably need a forever block. So they'll start to see those types of things and start preparing for them and, and it'll go much, much faster. So I just completed my game. I wanna play again. I click my green flag. I don't have any sample tubes. And the reason is because when we played the game last, we hid the sample tube when it got collected. We need to tell this game, hey, we're starting over, bring that sample tube back. And if you were looking carefully when we were look when we were looking, when we were viewing the looks blocks, right next to hide was a show button. So I'm going to click the show button and uh, the show block and drag it out here. And we've got to think about where we want it to go. And you can let kids put it wherever they want, because if it doesn't work, that just means they have to figure out where it needs to go. And if I were to put it in the if then statement and I hit the go button, well, it's still hidden. It can't, can't show itself if it, if it's, not touching the fetch rover. So I'm going to go over here where I know it was. Well, if I touch it and show it, but then immediately hide it, I'm never going to see it because this computer is running this program so fast. So that's probably not the best place. I can drag these out. Sometimes they, they get stuck together and you've got to sort of separate the blocks when you pull them apart. Um, and I'm actually going to just kind of give you the answer right here. And that is to put the show block underneath when the green flag is clicked and outside of the forever block. So it's above the forever block. That way, when I click on the green flag, going down this list of blocks, when the green flag is clicked, show the sample tube sprite, then forever look to see if it's touching the fetch rover. And if it is, hide it. Now I can go back and collect it and I can stop my game and I can start it again and when I click the green flag again, it will appear. The only thing that you should be aware of is if I collect my tube and I'm super excited and I stop driving, if I start my game again, I'm starting the game right where the sample tube is. And so I've got to make sure I drive away from where the sample tube is when I start my game. Otherwise, as soon as I start the game, the tube will immediately disappear because the game starts and I'm touching the tube. So something to keep in mind, uh, that your that your students um, and campers may run into. All right, so those are the two blocks that are there to complete the the sort of the the base level game. Again, you can add a timer, you can add other things. Um, now the reason, well, I'm not going to go into to the rest of the steps for timing's sake, but if you're thinking, how am I ever going to figure out how to do those other components? I encourage you to explore, but also I'm going to put a link in, whoops, I'm going to put a link in the chat. And this link is to 
the Mars helicopter video game lesson. The Mars helicopter video game lesson has a tutorial video that talks about things like adding a scoring uh, system, I think adding a scoring system, a timer and things like that. So you can play around with things. Um, and we also have some teacher edition uh, or teacher editions, some, some teacher guides, educator guides that you can look at for more detailed steps on how to complete some of these um, steps as well. So let me put a link if I can find that link for the sample video game. So the link I'm putting in the chat now, I put in um, Kodamar's helicopter that has a video tutorial and the Code of Mars sample. Oops, I'm sorry. I just put the wrong. Did I put the right one in there? Yeah. The um, the second link that I put in there is the the Code of Mars sample collection video game um, educator guide. So you can look in and see. Um, if you're looking at my screen here, you can see um, all the different sections, and um, it gives you more information about what blocks to use and how to how to use these different parts. So you can see the samples there. All right, um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Oda. Awesome, thanks so much, Lyle. I, I learned something new every time that I watch you do this because I am not the Scotch expert um, and it's, it's so nice to, uh, to learn something new. Um, so thanks for, for doing that. And folks, I hope that you learned something and could kind of follow along. If, um, if you have trouble, you can go back and watch the recording of this program. Um, we'll have it up sometime this afternoon if my, if my computer works correctly today. <laughs> um, so uh, in closing, I wanna just uh, remind you that we are taking submissions from you at this thing called the Student Showcase. Um, if you go to the Mars student, Mission to Mars Student Challenge page, there is a, a place you can click called Showcase. If you click on that, it pops you down to another button, and you click over, and it takes you to the Mission to Mars Student Showcase, where you can share your work with us. Um, now, I've preloaded a few things over here. You, it, you can just scroll down and see things from folks from all over the world. Um, some of them are sharing pictures of their 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 rover scratch games some of them are showing their cardboard rovers uh, just all sorts of things so um, if you are an educator we ask that you you don't show students faces but parents can go ahead and submit um, and give approval for their their students faces to show but if you're an educator uh, make sure the kids are not identifiable so you can just show their work uh, so we have lots of cool stuff. We want you to share what you're doing uh, so that we can see the cool stuff that you're doing. Um, remember, uh, July 15th, we're gonna be asking for your best practices. We'll be in touch with you about that. We will be sharing some of the student work that is um, submitted on the showcase and then hearing from some of you about your best practices. I uh, wanna remind you also, my colleague, Leslie, has a, a blog for out of school time programs on Boost Cafe. Please check that out at your convenience. She writes a blog entry a few times a year that will show and highlight some NASA educational resources that are appropriate for camps and out of school time. And then my colleague, Amelia, who has been answering your questions, knows everything there is to know about this Museum and Informal Education Alliance. Uh, Amelia, what can you tell us? All right, so this is a community of practice designed for educators in informal settings. So those of you running summer camps, uh, working at museums, science centers, parks, if you are helping kids learn outside of a school setting, this is for you. Uh, we uh, list there what we offer, uh, direct assistance, because we know that you know, NASA is exciting. People want to connect with NASA, but it's also very overwhelming. So our whole purpose is to give you assistance, a member website of resources that are great for informal education, calendar, a chat forum. Uh, you get to hear from NASA experts to hear about upcoming missions and be prepared. And we keep in touch with you with a weekly newsletter. So the, the link is there. And again, this is for informal educators and we're glad to have you on there. You and your staff are welcome. Thanks, Amelia. And 
As many of you have heard me say before, I am a huge fan of my alliance. Uh, not only can you as an adult staff member or organizer for your, for your team get individual help from the uh, My Alliance team, but they have these cool briefings, these where they, they give you a, a PowerPoint and an expert will go through and talk about the latest mission events. Um, it's not just Mars stuff, it's all kinds of stuff from NASA. And I get to learn. That's how I uh, learn a lot about missions is attending the My Alliance uh, telecon. So, so please do uh, join the My Alliance group and, um, and you can uh, have more, more enrichment as, as time goes on. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Again, the Mars Student Challenge is at go.nasa.gov slash mars-challenge. If you um, run into any trouble, if you're a Museum Alliance group, um, group member, then you can contact them and they'll uh, help you out. And um, again, we'll hope to see you on July 15th when you will be sharing with us. So have a good rest of your day and thanks again for the work that you do with our youth. You have the tough job. Uh, we hope that our work has make, made your work a little bit easier. So have a good summer and we'll see you in a month. Bye-bye.